On behalf of the post 2015 team in Jordan, I'd like to welcome Ms. Ali Azriqat, Director of the Communication and International Relations Department at the High Council for the Affairs of Persons with Disabilities. Alia, welcome. Thank you. Uh, in your view, what kind of policies, strategies or interventions have been most successful in addressing inequalities so far? Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that the question relates to inequalities relating to people with disabilities. So I'm going to speak in that regard. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, if we look at the, the lifespan of the MDGs or the Millennium Development Goals, which is from 2000 to 2015, I'd say the, one of the most successful and, and indeed um, global intervention is the um, <coughs> introduction and development of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities um, <coughs> that was called for in 2000, just after the MDGs were announced um, and took almost six years to develop until the, the actual adoption in 2006. So I think as an intervention, a global intervention, it was the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, that convention, as we know, is the first international agreement or treaty of the 21st century, so that's a double achievement. Um, um, it has set the stage for um, uh, introducing and reiterating the need for focusing on issues relating to disabilities, not only in terms of, of national countries, but in terms of the global community as represented by the UN. Um, now, as a result of that um, um, intervention, which, um, which we signed in March 2007 and we ratified as Jordan in March 2008, um, by virtue of Article 33 of the U UN Convention, um, every country has to um, um, have a, a kind of steering committee, a national body that kind of responds and, and, and ensures the proper implementation of the country's commitments to that convention. So as Jordan, and in order to translate our commitments um, nationally, um, <coughs> we have um, His Majesty King Abdullah II called in 2007 for the uh, development of a national strategy for persons with disabilities and by default, by virtue of that strategy, we have um, three major milestones to place. Uh, one was the um, <coughs> annulment of the oil flow for the welfare of the disabled, 1993. Um, the second thing is the the replacement of that old law with a new current law, which is the law number 31 for the year 2007. Um, that law is a rights-based law. Um, it is it it deals with disability as a, via a rights-based approach and the, the person with the disability is at the core of all um, activities and functions and interventions by virtue of that law. And then finally we have, by virtue of law number 31 for the year 2007, we have the creation and the establishment of HCD, the Higher Council for Affairs of Persons with Disabilities, as an independent public entity that is responsible for following up and overseeing the um, implementation of Jordan's commitments on a national scale. Mm -hmm. Do you think the MDGs drew enough attention to the persons with disabilities? Um, unfortunately, the MDGs um, made no mention of disability or people with disabilities. And that is in fact one of the reasons why back then when, when, when they were announced um, after the summit, the 2000 Global Summit, um, that the disability community back then went into a kind of uproar. And that was why they called for an international convention, a UN convention that would answer to the apparent gaps that, that exist at the global, regional, and national level. So as a direct response to the, um, 
lack of mention of disability issues within the MDGs you have in your production. Mm -hmm. How can the combination of environmental and attitudinal barriers within communities and institutions lead to persons with disabilities being effectively excluded from participating in social, civil and political processes, do you think? Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned um, environmental and attitudinal. I think before environmental, there's, it's the focus on attitudinal. Mm -hmm. Attitudinal um, barriers are, are perhaps the first port of call into acceptance and integration and inclusion in, in any society. Acceptance of, of the, fa the parents, the family and the, the community and then society at large is the number one factor or the number one, the, number, the first step toward um, inclusion. So when we have attitudinal barriers um, we have no acceptance, um, there's stigma associated with the disability, there's shame, and, and that leads to the, pers um, the family and parents um, denying the existence of a disability in the first place, which makes it difficult for them to look for solutions. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, as we know, you know, acceptance is halfway the solution. That's that's in terms of attitudinal bias. In terms of environmental bias, and it is connected to attitudinal bias. If we have um, if we have obstacles in terms of physical um, the physical environment or the communicational environment, you you prevent us from being able to get to a certain point, get to the ac uh, to access. Um, um, facilities, services, um, we're not able to come out of our shells and, 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 and go out to the home beyond the doorstep and kind of interact with people because as, as we know, if people see us, the more people see us, the, the more they, they know about us, the more they know about our needs, um, um, the more they, they appreciate and accept that although we may look different, we're all one and the same. We have apparent physical differences, but at the end of the day, if given the equal opportunities, and if, given, um, if given the chance and the opportunity to be a functional citizen and to be rehab properly rehabilitated, then we can. So actually having those two barriers is dangerous. Persons with disabilities in all societies can experience economic inequality as a result of their marginalization. Mm -hmm. How can this risk uh, be reduced in your opinion? When we talk about um, in economic in inequalities, there has to be certain prerequisites. Pre um, to reduce that risk and to make people with disabilities more functional, obviously you need to start the core, to start at the beginning. And to start at the beginning means that we need to focus on um, inclusive um, inclusion and early intervention at a young age. So, um, <coughs> So it's early intervention, early diagnosis as a child, and then um, proper rehabilitation, obviously, and then you have inclusive education. So education, education, education. If you equip them with the proper education and you include them in schools and, 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 and those small educa educational communities, you're actually preparing um, you're actually preparing people with disabilities for what comes later. So, so inclusive education policies, strategies um, are, are the start. Um, as HCD, we have an an um, education um, programs department that um, that works um, on on implement on implementing our inclusive education policy or strategy as outlined. Um, in the national strategy for, for um, persons with disabilities. Um, <clears throat> currently, the way we do that, we subsidize transport fees to allow um, people with disabilities to be included, to go and access um, uh, schools, government schools in their communities. Um, <clears throat> we also have the Prince Vlad Scholarship for people with disabilities interested in higher education. Um, I think just last year, we. There are about 885 students with disabilities enrolled in that program. Um, so that is in terms of education. 
And when you talk about employment, obviously, again, as I said, the, 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 the skills, the basic skills are, are supposedly given during, um, you know, your educational years and your schooling years. But in terms of employment, um, it is, it's, there are mul multiple factors. There is um, equipping, obviously, the person with a disability with the skill that matches the, the needs of the job market. And then there is, you know, making that match between the needs of the, of, of the, of the demand and the supply. And then um, ensuring that not, not only are they given the jobs and recruited, but they're also, um, they receive on the job training so that people with disabilities, once they're in, 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 on the job, they can be trained, they can be coached not only for them but also for the employer because obviously employers um, are not very well equipped to how to deal with people with disabilities. The assumption is unfortunately that you know if he has a person if he has a physical or, or a visual or a hearing impairment he's not as functional as other people whereas in fact studies show the absolute opposite you know people with disabilities are more disciplined they have, you know, they're more patient and they're very studious when they, you know, put the, you know, when they tackle anything and they don't finish it and keep it mm. one percent. So there's this due diligence that we have um, by virtue of us, you know, sitting in one place for a long time. In, in terms of me, for example, I sit for long hours, so it's a blessing in disguise, as they say. Mm. So, um, so there's that. So it's employers' awareness and training, and, and as well as people with disabilities on the job training, and the the peers in the workplace, mm -hmm. how to deal with people with disabilities, um, how, how to understand where, where to draw the line, when you can help, when you cannot help, um, and to appreciate that sometimes um, it's not you don't have to do things the conventional way. There innovative ways of how you can deal with, um, you know, you can do something or you can achieve something. And we, the only difference is perhaps we might just need a little bit of help, and, but we can do it. Mm -hmm. right. Do you have any key messages or recommendations that you would like to relay to those working on the post-2015 development framework? The first thing I think is going back to question one when you mentioned, um, or is it question two, I believe, where you mentioned that you know the the MDGs, the MDGs yeah. um, did th that did they make any mention or did they focus on disability in any sense? It is important that you know not to make the same mistake as last time, and to to explicitly as well as implicitly include people with disabilities within the post development agenda and the issues um, <coughs> um, so that perhaps disability can be included as a standalone segment as well as within other priority areas um, <coughs> and this is what we do here at, at HCB we work initially and, and perhaps um, mainly in order to include and, 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 and guarantee that issues with disabilities are, are issues of disability, sorry, are included within national um, policies and strategies. And so, in terms of messaging, it's to include people with disabilities and their issues and their voices within that um, dialogue and that framework or that agenda. And then to 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 reiterate um, the notion that development cannot be completely incomprehensibly inclusive unless disability is accounted for. And then um, to work on the implementation of that agenda with a clear and focused mechanism that will ensure that our voice is available and, and heard and loud and clear um, all, in all phases of the process and all steps of the do you have anything else to add before we conclude? It's important to say that as, as um, a member of HCD and as 
person with a disability, multiple disabilities myself. I think what the UN is, uh, is doing is fantastic. And I think those consultation uh, sessions are really um, enlightening. I think we're learning and you're learning. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it is a good um, sign for all of us in the disability community to, under, to know and to appreciate that really the UN and the UN community is learning from its first mistake. So we're really looking forward to the outcomes of, of this, um, this, um, these consultations and we're looking forward to the Jordanian report and hopefully um, everything will go well. Best of okay. luck. Thank you. Alia, on behalf of the Post 2015 team, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you. Thank you.